Hello and welcome. This is Legal Focus. I'm at the venue of the annual general conference of the Nigeria Bar Association. We're about 4,000 lawyers from all over the country gathered here in Lagos, Nigeria's commercial capital. We'll bring you highlights on the program today. Plus, course discharges and acquits former President Goodluck Jonathan's aid of laundering 1.6 billion naira. And later on the show, an exclusive interview with senior advocate of Nigeria, Paul Erokuro, will also tell you more about the law of contract in Nigeria. Welcome. The 2019 General Conference of the Nigerian Bar Association was tagged, facing the future. The organizers say the theme was carefully chosen to underscore the future of the legal profession, as well as businesses, the judiciary and government in a rapidly changing world, driven by fast-paced technological innovations and an increasing external competition in a globalized world. The four-day event comprised more than 40 technical sessions, 209 speakers from across the world, to address salient topics. The Attorney General of the Federation, Abubakar Malami, representing President Muhammadu Buhari, declared the conference open. As you go into this annual conference, let me assure you of the resolve of this administration to promote measures that will achieve a vibrant, economic, and safe country under which the practice of law will thrive. The Chief Justice of Nigeria, Ibrahim Tanko Mohamed, set the ball of robust discussions rolling. He addressed the concerns of financial autonomy for the judiciary. We will never be subservient to anybody, no matter how highly placed. All those that are concerned allow us to enjoy our independence. If you say or you claim that I am independent, but in a way, whether I like it or not, I have to go and bend down asking. I have lost my independence. The president of the International Bar Association also had a message for Nigerian lawyers. Clients expect nowadays us lawyers to be business advisors, risk advisors, financial advisors. Uh, uh, arbitration is nowadays giving more and more space to mediation. The several discussions covered diverse subjects like the rule of law and human rights, security, sexual harassment in the legal profession, gender equality and gender-based violence, the business environment and the future of legal practice in Nigeria, attracting huge interest and feedback from the team in audience. What we need to do right now is to encourage our girls to come out in the open to report any kind of sexual abuse wherever, in the schools, in the workplace, because by doing this, we will be able to take proper account of what is going on and be able to deal with it. During the annual general meeting, a salient tradition that falls at this time, the NBA's constitution is amended, and as the communique is delivered to end this year's conference, the NBA president says Nigeria should take a cue from this innovation. Interesting if the Nigerian nation would learn something from what the Nigerian Bar Association has done. And if the qualification for holding offices, and there's nothing wrong with that qualification starting with the president of the federation. That the president of the federation should be somebody who has some skills, who has some administrative expertise, who has some exposure, who has done something, and who's going to be able to administer, and who understands um, basic issues in regard to governance. There is also an earnest expectation that recommendations from this August gathering will be swiftly implemented 
for a much better bar and a stronger nationhood. The FCC's notice of appeal against Justice Idris's judgment pursuant to Section 241-1A of the 1999 Constitution is premised on nine counts of appeal. EFCC Prosecutor Rutimu Yedipu states that the judge erred in law by discharging and acquitting the respondents on counts of conspiracy. In the particulars of the notice, Justice Idris was said to have failed to bind himself with the age-long principle of law which provides that conspiracy is complete upon agreement. Mr. Dudafar and Iwejo, in their defense, had both stated they didn't know each other until the time of their arrest. But the EFCC relies on the age-long principle of law that once a conspiracy has come into existence, other conspirators may join in at a later stage, and it's not necessary for the conspirators to know themselves or the full extent of the scheme to which a conspirator has joined himself. The judge had stated that the EFCC should have preferred further evidence to corroborate the extrajudicial statements of the defendants. But the EFCC argues that the judge departed from the settled position of law, that confession alone is sufficient to support a conviction without corroboration, so long as the court is satisfied of the truth of the confession. The EFCC also says the trial judge erred in law when he held that the appellants failed to call vital witnesses, including former President Goodluck Jonathan and former National Security Advisor Sambo Dasuki. But Rotimu Yedipo argues that the prosecution needn't call any number of witnesses or hordes of witnesses or even call all material witnesses since in law a sole credible witness is sufficient to prove a charge not requiring corroboration in law. The prosecution insists it wasn't under any obligation to prove facts already stated by the respondents. Justice Mohammed Idris had stated in his judgment that EFCC failed to do a thorough investigation before charging the defendants to court. But the EFCC hopes the appellate court will convict Wari Pamo Dafa and Iwejuo Joseph of the 1.6 billion naira corruption charges and sentence them as prescribed by the amended Money Laundering Prohibition Act of 2011 and the EFCC Act of 2004. The law school's practice of sending students on attachment gives students practical experience on what to expect while practicing. Although there has to be a method of enforcement to make sure that those students that are sent on attachment are not just sitting in the offices and taking notes. They have to be engaged practically in all the affairs of practice in order for them to learn. And they have to go places on their own or meet with clients or be able to do other things. For instance, uh, most law students are just allowed to sit down and take notes or observe. Normally that's not enough. The content, the training content, is it sufficient to ground and you know, prepare the young lawyers to face what's outside, face practice outside. So I, I will say not exactly so because there's rapidity in the area of you know, information technology that's affecting every facet of life. And legal practice is not exempted. So if you know, the legal training doesn't take into cognizance you know, the impact of IT to law, if that is not you know, taken into full cognizance, then the lawyers and the young lawyers are not going to be fully prepared. Basically, Nigeria education system doesn't really prepare you for the outside world. It's like a, it, it, it's, it's a different ball game when you're out there. But I can say the university didn't really prepare us for the outside world, but the law school quite did. Because in law school, I felt like, have I been studying law all the while in university? And then I felt in university, I was taking some courses that were not even 
related to well and then they are not even useful to me these days even in practice but the law school took us well took us practically took us in the procedural aspect of law which i didn't experience at all in the year. so i also encourage the universities if the universities can incorporate procedural law into the, the curriculum This is the advocate segment where we meet legal luminaries who have made a mark in the learning profession. Our advocate this week is Paul Rokuro, Senior Advocate of Nigeria. Good to have you on the program, sir. Thank you. Sir, let's go over to the beginning. Take us through your childhood and at what point did you decide to become a lawyer? I was born in a town called Ogoja and um, nowadays the name of that town will not ring a bell with you young ones but in those days Ogoja was a divisional headquarters as well as a provincial headquarters which is the rough equivalent of a state capital today places like Abakaliki which is the state capital now were under Ogoja Afibo, far-flung areas like um, uh, Abi, Crossover, Ugev, all of those places all reported to Ogoja so that's where I was born my father lived there and uh, he was a businessman, successful businessman, by the standards of the time. And um, I was the only child of my father and mother. Mm. I was the only child of that union. Shortly thereafter, they went their separate ways. My father went on to marry many wives and have many other children. My mother married other husbands and had kids too. So I am the only one that uh, was born by that union. My father and mother conspired against me to take me into township <laughs> and um, took me. So I went to Ogoja to okay. live with uh, my dad and then went on to finish primary school, secondary school. And um, Secondary school, I went to a great college called Marinol College. You won't hear much about it now again because, again, the status of Ogoja has gone down. So nobody cares about what happens there now. First, I um, thought about being a lawyer. Uh, probably the play, The Incorruptible Judge. Yeah. There was an old play that um, I acted. Um, a judge whose um, son committed an offense. And um, he tried his son and found him guilty. And then there was the influence of uh, the lawyers that used to visit my father's house. Um, Aniagolu, uh, Oputa, Ndomaegba, these were all lawyers that uh, I saw as a child and I would listen to their arguments and discussion. So, but of course, the strongest influence was Ndomaegba, who was my father's very close friend. And I was frequent in our house every day, virtually every week. And um, I would, um, I was always, in, I, I was struck by the, the way they carried themselves, the, the way they spoke. They hardly, I, I don't ever remember any of those lawyers losing their temper. I never ever remember seeing that. My ambition at that time was simply to do. HSC, high level courses, get my A levels and teach. Wow. I knew I would go to university someday, but my immediate ambition was to teach the secondary school and impress the kids, impart knowledge the way other teachers had impressed me. I wanted to be that for other students. So the law came as, um, as a surprise, really. Very interesting. So, okay, now take us through the era of your apprenticeship. Like, who did you, would I call it, serve under? And how was the experience like? It was fantastic. For NYSC, everybody wanted to serve a little, except me. I was totally relaxed. People were going around begging, uh, going to NYC to lobby, calling their parents, doing all manner of things to get posted to Lagos. And I was absolutely relaxed because. There was no chance of going to Lagos. I had nobody to lobby for me. I was not lobbying. I hated Lagos. So I didn't care where I was sent to. And then the list came out. 
and my name was right up there, close to the top of the list, Lagos. And this was really, really, really annoying. Lagos, why? Why was I going to stay? Then people came to me and said, let's exchange. I was posted to Jaws around the building. Let's exchange. I was posted to Canon. I was posted to Portacot. Then something in me said, no, I didn't want this Lagos. But if this is where God wants me to serve, then I'll serve in Lagos. So I resolved to serve in Lagos. And then, as soon as I took that decision, I had fantastic accommodation in Lagos. Chimeka gone, we saw recipes. Gave me a commission at uh, number 78 Tinubu Road, Lukwaju. Fantastic place. Near Pablo Vestig. So, we reported for work on the Friday. Um, Serena Takubo, Walter Nogan, uh, Missy Bidapo Bay, um, one of the Shoney Barry boys. Those are the ones I can know myself. And as we reported, as we reported I was posted to the director of public prosecution, who at the time was Mr. S. A. Laurie. Onogan was uh, posted to the Solicitor General's office. We were working directly under a G. Me, who was Solicitor General. Um, one other person was in the Attorney General's office. Uh, but uh, the bulk of us were with the director of public prosecution. So we reported that Friday and uh, met the DPP talked to us and said, okay, work starts at 7.30, so you have to be here before 7.30. And um, if you come at 7, fine, but you never know, you might have to go to court. Said, okay. So on Monday, I was in the office at about a quarter to seven. And uh, the DPP sent uh, Somebody to inquire whether any of the young lawyers had arrived. And I was the only one that arrived. I said, okay. My guy wants to see you, so I went to go. And the DPP handed over the file over to me and said, you're going to call the appearance before Justice Candy Johnson. Wow. I said, okay. So, sir, uh, who is going to lead me? He's going to lead you. <laughs> yeah, no, you go to court. Read the file. I said, there's no time to study the file. He said, they will give you a synopsis. A uh, man was charged with stealing and uh, applied for bail. The magistrate refused on the grounds that the amount stolen was too large, so he wouldn't consider bail. So I don't think we should oppose bail because the magistrate's reason is just not reasonable. I don't think we should oppose. But look, I don't have time to take the file. Be on your way to court now. So I took the file and um, got in the taxi and. Um, on my way to court, I studied the file. So reading it, I could see that the magistrate's reason was really quite curious. The man was charged with stealing 7,000 naira, and the magistrate said, this amount is too large for one person to steal. If he doesn't, he said, before I can consider bail, he must reform at least half of this money. Then I will consider bail. I could then see why the DPP said we should not oppose, because it meant that the magistrate had already decided he was guilty even before the trial started. Because for you to say you should refund part of the money means that you've decided that the money is within. Yes. But the man has not been tried. So that's why the people said, no, it's not, it won't be fair to oppose bail in these circumstances. So I said, okay. But then I began to, I read the document. And I saw that uh, the education was incompetent. The ruling of the magistrate was not attached, it ought to have been there. A copy of the charge itself was not attached, it ought to have been there. Because without those things, how would the High Court determine whether the magistrate was right or wrong? Oh, exactly. So, hmm. Well, it's not fair for this man to be in custody. I was thinking to myself now. On the other hand, the application is competent. So I was still undecided when they called out the case. 
Mm. And the judge, and after an announcement, the judge pointedly asked me, Mr. Okoro, are you opposing bail? <laughs> what did you say? And uh, I said, um, no, 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 my instructions are that I should not oppose bail. And um, truly, the reason given by the magistrate for using bail was rather unfortunate. But the application is also incompetent. So I leave the matter to the discretion of them. Oh, no, you can't leave it to my discretion, you have to decide. They now look at me and say, um, so have you appeared before me before? I said, no, my lord, this is my very first case as a lawyer. And the courtroom went, hmm. <laughs> and everybody turned to see this curious person. So the lawyer on the other side got up and said, well, this is not the law school. If he doesn't know what to do, he should go back to law school. So, and then the judge said, hey, my friend, be quiet. On your first day in court, were you able to stand up straight? Away? And then he talked to him and said, Mr. Said, my first day in court, I was so scared. Sweat was dripping from my face. <laughs> so you are doing very well. Yes, I agree with you. The magistrate reason has stated in this article. But, but why do you say the application is incompetent? I told him. So, so, okay, this is not here. The judge looked through. I told the lawyer and said, Where such and such documents? I said, Oh, my lord, the magistrate refused to release the facts, but you know what to do. Uh, Mr. Rekker, congratulations, you won your first case. <laughs> So, sir, talking about that particular case, how did you feel? Oh, I was just about to tell you. Mm. So I got back to the chambers. Of course, I was walking on air. And, uh, <laughs> I can't imagine. I, uh, you know, and then I turned to Nogan and to um, Dokubo. Have you ever appeared in court and conducted the case, let alone won your first <laughs> case? Talk to me with respect, sir. He's in the newly minted case. And all that, I made a lot of noise about it until uh, a few days later, I was assigned to assist um, Mr. Bayo Manua in prosecuting Mr. Oladipo Maja. Oladipo Maja was a very wealthy man and a top medical doctor. He had um, achieved some notoriety by being one of those who uh, gave evidence against Chief Awolo during his trial. Yes, so I think that, I think that was, well, anyway, he had played some role in that matter. And it was a very, 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 very difficult case. But um, I'm proud to say that uh, we got him convicted and mm. uh, he served a jail term. More often than not, at that time, I went to court with uh, justice, well, well, it wasn't a justice then, with Body Road Survivor, who was um, a senior state counsel. And uh, I would carry his bag, of course, and his files and uh, appear with him. So those were very good times, and I learned a lot of law. But everybody, who passed with the Lagos State Minister of Justice came out very well. We looked down with all due respect to them, but we actually looked down on the Federal Minister of Justice as on serious lawyers. The Lagos State Minister of Justice was a pressure cooker. You had to be at your very best. Welcome to today's segment of You and the Law. At the last segment, we did explain what contract is, the types of contract, and elements of a valid contract. We will continue that conversation today, or that discussion today, by examining vitiating elements of a contract. Yes, granted that a contract has been created between two parties, there are situations or circumstances under which a contract that has been validly entered into can be brought to an end. Contract that has been created between Mr. A and Mr. B can be brought to an end in law if some elements are established or some of these factors arises, including fraud, undue influence, duress, misrepresentation. Let me start with fraud. Where a party, in entering into a contract, defrauds the other or makes fraudulent misrepresentation that was not known at the time of creation of the contract. That contract can be brought to an end. The party that is the victim of that fraud has the right in law to end and terminate that contract. Again, where a party is made to sign to a contract under duress, that is by force. 
that party has the right to seek redress, to terminate that contract, to rescind that contract, and resell from the performance of his obligations under that contract. So therefore, duress is a vitiating element. That is why a contract has to be made freely, by free will, by both parties. Undue influence is a situation where someone is not necessarily made to do something by force. But some influence is unduly exerted on that person, possibly due to the position of the person that is exerting the influence. Again, I want to also state that, yes, a contract has been created, but it is possible that while parties have committed themselves to the performance of a contract, what we call frustration can occur. Frustration basically is a situation in law whereby parties are discharged from their obligations under a contract, or where the performance of the terms of the contract becomes impossible as a result of circumstances that are beyond the control of both parties. When can this occur? Frustration, for example, can occur where the subject, the lease of the contract, no longer exists. That is where what parties have agreed to do. And that subject of the contract is no longer in existence. That contract is deemed to be frustrated. Frustration can also occur by act of God. For example, earthquake, natural, other natural disasters, and so on. Where that has the effect on the performance of the contract, both parties are discharged from the obligations under the contract. Government policies can also frustrate a contract. For example, where the government comes up with a policy, or a law is passed that has influence and has direct effect on the terms of the contract. Illegality is another reason why a contract may not be able to be enforced, why it may not be possible to enforce the terms of a contract. In the way a party has agreed to do something that the law has forbidden, such a contract cannot be enforced. Where a contract is also contrary to public policy, such contracts can also not be enforced. And that's Legal Focus for today, reaching you from the venue of the annual general conference of the Nigerian Bar Association. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.